Uh, I'm David Lees. I'm the CTO here at Basis Technologies. I've been with Basis for about four years or so now. Um, prior to that, I spent most of my career in, uh, in or around the SAP space, uh, primarily at uh, Procter & Gamble. Uh, John, do you want to do a quick intro yourself? Yeah, thank you, David. Um, so my name is John, as David said. I'm part of the Customer Success Engineer team. I've been Basis Technologies for about five years, roughly. Um, and been working alongside the solution specialist from a delivery perspective, and my uh, experience is around 10 to 12 years of SAP. Thanks, David. Perfect. All right. Many thanks, John. So uh, let's take a quick look at the uh, the agenda that we have for today. Um, so I'm going to go through a, a bit of a walkthrough, uh, looking at the different use cases, really, around change integration and orchestration in the SAP world. Uh, and then John is going to bring his experience and talk through uh, a number of customer examples and best practices to consider when approaching this particular topic. And then lastly, we will close with, with a summary and, uh, and hopefully uh, one or two questions at the end. So um, let's, dive, let's dive in. A uh, little bit about who we are um, first. So we, we've been around in the SAP space as our kind of niche for a number of years now, since the late 90s. Um, headquartered out of London, but global presence in uh, Dallas, Sydney, Berlin, Budapest. Uh, we have over 100, uh, sorry, over 200 customers across uh, the 25 different industries. And you can see some of those uh, sample uh, customers uh, here on the screen. Um, we have a portfolio of products uh, that focuses on the change uh, automation uh, and regression testing space. Uh, today, seeing as we're focusing on the orchestration and integration, that's primarily uh, for our active control um, product that you see here, um, that we'll be kind of looking at those particular use cases. Um, and really, the, the kind of reason why customers come to us is, is pretty varied. Uh, it kind of stems from across all the different areas from the kind of more traditional compliance and audit or automation, uh, as well as more of the transformational activities like S4HANA transformations or upgrades, uh, cloud migration, all the way through to agile DevOps and CICD. Uh, and we'll be kind of touching on some of the CICD aspects today. We'll be touching on automation today and to some extent on the compliance and audit and uh, S4 transformation topics. Um, these are some of the very high level uh, business uh, benefits that customers see uh, across uh, the deployment of our solutions, driving, uh, driving down cost uh, within the application development cycle, uh, driving up or improving efficiency. Uh, and we'll touch on obviously a lot of that, I think, today as we look at the, the orchestration and the integration use cases, uh, faster in innovation, and uh, obviously with less risk. So um, let's let's start to look at the, some of the use cases. And it was only really when when actually building out these slides that it became as apparent that there are maybe more uh, integration or orchestration use cases than than maybe you would first think of um, when considering managing change both within an SAP uh, estate, but also beyond. Uh, that uh, that SAP estate. Um, so let's get into some of those now. The first base case, let's say, just to, to level set, uh, is managing change in a traditional landscape. Example here, three tier, uh, dev, QA, prod. Some of the basic capabilities that you would expect to be able to manage that are workflow, um, approvals, um, being able to, to manage uh, certain changes with more, more automation, less approvals than others, um, automated analysis to look at things like dependencies and sequencing, um, having the ability to report, audit trail, and manage uh, standard activities like uh, a system refresh, for example, are all very basic uh, capabilities of managing change in a single uh, landscape scenario. As we then move into uh, a second scenario, so still within one landscape, 
but multi-track change, uh, sometimes referred to as dual track or N plus one. So this is where change is, is handled either in the primary track, normally in a kind of a maintenance mode, or in a project track in parallel, um, but in a way that allows the, the maintenance change to move through uh, without any kind of impact or overlap with what's happening in the project track. Uh, that needs to be merged um, or retrofitted into the project track to keep that project track uh, up to date. And similarly, once the project is ready, that needs to go uh, into the uh, the standard landscape, either via dev through to prod in a traditional sense, or sometimes that may go uh, directly into prod, and then that can be uh, kind of merged back into the uh, the maintenance dev and QA. So here you're obviously looking to understand where there are conflicts, where the same objects have been changed in both the maintenance track and the project track. Uh, looking to drive as much automation as possible for that merge so that it's uh, it's never uh, kind of out of sync or it doesn't get out of sync um, and that there's no risk for manual uh, rekeying issues um, if you're not able to do or not, not uh, performing a high amount of uh, the automated merge. So that's the scenario, the second scenario uh, that we look at. The third one, this is again very natural for most customers, is to say we have two or more uh, different SAP landscapes. Uh, could either be, uh, in this case, these are both, um, uh, this is ABAP and BW, um, but you may have a change that needs to move through those corresponding landscapes in a coordinated or orchestrated way. Um, so, for example, it only makes sense if the uh, the BW change goes through after or at the same time as the back end uh, change. Um, so here you're obviously looking to make sure you can map any uh, dependencies, uh, ensure that the deployment is happening in a synchronized way or at least in a sequenced way. And being able to kind of report on where anything is um, is blocked or dependent upon uh, a change elsewhere in the landscape. Um, the next scenario, and this obviously comes about now, and especially in the S4 world, is managing different technology types, but within the same landscape. So here. Uh, you could be moving through an ABAP change, which has an underlying CDS view and a Fiori object or a BW object, all within the same landscape. Again, the same requirements could, um, could be applicable here in terms of modeling and managing the dependencies between these objects or ensuring that they all move together uh, as they form part of a a complete solution uh, of some kind. Now, um, here we start to look at uh, another scenario where you're managing change with uh, different technologies, but across different landscapes. So in the PI, PO space, for example, where you're managing maybe ABAP changes in your ECC landscape alongside uh, Java, changes uh, in uh, your one of your other SAP systems. Um, again, a lot of the same principles apply, a lot of the same requirements um, are applicable here as well when it comes to understanding and being able to, where necessary, model those relationships or those dependencies. Uh, again, if companies are trying to still do this today manually, it can be quite uh, cumbersome, quite error prone. Um, it's important to really look at uh, these scenarios and, and try and drive as much of the management of this within your tool of choice. Um, we then start to look at, and again, this is still technically kind of within the SAP uh, realm, but we start to look at the orchestration between the on prem and the cloud environments. Um, here, 
we're looking at a BTP scenario or example with the integration with cloud TMS to manage, again, the orchestration of change between the on-prem system and the, uh, the cloud platform um, deployment, be it for an integration of some kind or a, uh, a custom app uh, or extension that's been built uh, directly in uh, the BTP uh, itself, BTP being the business technology platform uh, from, from SAP. Um, now, still staying within the world of, uh, of SAP, but looking at integrating or automating stages of the development life cycle, so starting to kind of build out the continuous integration, uh, continuous delivery side of things, here is where you would want to look at enforcing or automating um, things like uh, code quality inspection, code scanning, including uh, things like uh, vulnerability analysis that can be with uh, out of the box tools uh, from SAP like uh, SAP Code Inspector or ABAP Test Cockpit, uh, as well as or alongside other um, best of breed tooling in the SAP sp space, such as from Anapsis. Similarly, um, unit testing um, would be applicable here if you're uh, investing in or, or looking to invest in uh, ABAP unit, for example, if we're still talking the ABAP landscapes here, uh, as well as impact analysis or test scoping, um, looking at integration with uh, other tools from our platform, such as Active Discover. Um, and really, this uh, again is is part of that integration architecture that you need to consider when um, kind of looking at both the orchestration aspects of uh, a kind of best of breed uh, SAP uh, application development lifecycle, um, as well as or alongside the um, the change orchestration scenarios that we looked at previously. Um, now, one of the final ones uh, that again is becoming more and more common um, for us, uh, actually two more to go, this one uh, starts to look at orchestration of change between the SAP and the non-SAP uh, ecosystems. Um, when you have, for example, a change that's being deployed in uh, your web uh, presence of some kind, and for whatever reason, that needs to be coordinated with a change in the back end. Here, you need to look at the integration between pipelines. Um, in the case of things like GitLab or Azure DevOps, um, where you want to be able to model some kind of dependency. It could be that the SAP change needs to go first, or it could be uh, the other way around. Uh, or they need to be somehow coordinated and deployed at the same time. Um, and then finally, we start to get into the uh, the end-to-end -end, uh, integration, um, where a kind of a best-of-breed tool chain. Many enterprises these days have the likes of ServiceNow uh, from an ITSM or ticketing uh, standpoint, or the likes of Jira or equivalent tools um, for the management of backlog or requirements. And again, it's important to, to look at the integration for these solutions end to end in order to minimize manual activities, uh, in order to eliminate uh, any issues caused with not having kind of a single version of the truth out there. And it's when you put all nine of those use cases together, those various orchestration uh, use cases that we've looked at, uh, as well as the CICD uh, automation or integration, uh, along with the integrations from a best of breed standpoint or uh, into the kind of the non-SAP 
uh, part of the, um, the architecture, that it really starts to highlight how complex um, this whole area becomes. Um, and trying again, coming back to the kind of some of the original um, benefits here, trying to do this without automation, trying to do this uh, with spreadsheets or without the right tooling, as some of our kind of customers come to us from that come from state, uh, can really be a, a big challenge. Uh, in being able to manage that, what is becoming a, a more and more complex and more and more integrated um, world where the SAP portion of an enterprise can no longer operate in isolation uh, and more and more coordination is needed between the, the non-SAP world, the SAP world, and even within the SAP uh, environments themselves. So those are the, the, the primary um, use cases that we wanted to walk through and some of the key challenges. Um, now I'm going to pass the ball over to John, who's going to walk us through uh, some specific customer examples and some of the value that they have seen, some of the pain points that they were observing prior to, um, to working with us. And then uh, John will also go into some of the best practices that we have or that we observe in trying to help customers uh, in thinking about uh, an overall strategy for change orchestration and integrating within uh, a much broader ecosystem. Uh, so John, uh, I'll pass the ball over to you. Thank you very much, David. Appreciate that. So, hello everyone, once again. Um, to go into the first client example, we'll go through about three or four of them. Um, but essentially, touching very much on, on a few of the topics that David spoke of, the, the first one we're looking at is the multi-track change from ECC to S4 transformation. Uh, the client we're looking at here is Vista Print. And essentially, what they were looking for here uh, was automation to de-risk and eliminate manual effort. So, it's something that David touched on previously. Um, is this kind of manual work that always has to be done, this manual retrofit, this kind of manual uh, tasks that need to be kind of always tracked. Um, and this is where we come in um, and using this kind of multi-track change uh, automation to eliminate that manual effort um, and de-risk essentially um, changes that they need to be uh, validated into the secondary track in this case. Uh, what we did with them as well is essentially uh, the retrofit moved from a bi-weekly to a daily through this automation. So where the team were kind of going every second week, validating the changes, validating the conflicts um, through manual effort, once again, as per, per, as per the previous slide, uh, previous well, the point there, um, we cut that down to a daily where they kind of validated conflicts. They made sure everything was fine before they could then move over to the S4 landscape in this case. Um, and the last one, obviously, post this S4 transformation, uh, we also did reduce time to market uh, where they basically had every three weeks now down to daily. Um, so with these kind of changes in place, it did help Bristol Print move everything, um, and therefore the S4 transformation was very successful. Um, and it was something great to see with the, with the client. So moving on to the next client, um, what you'll basically see here is the tool chain integration example that David worked through. Uh, the client here was John Deere, we worked with, that we worked through very closely. We do still collaborate with them very much so. Uh, their main pain point here was around misalignment, um, and they also did have something that they were touched on very well as well, is that multiple version of truth, right? So in today's world, we do have our change process that has got one source of truth, and then we have our release process that may have a different source of truth. Um, and in this case, we're trying to integrate those tool chains to ensure that we have that one single source of truth, um, not just for efficiency, but also for effectiveness, of course. Um, and due to this, we streamline and we automate that process and the delivery workflow because of that. Um, the other thing that comes into this is that it does enforce the governance as well as that quality control due to the fact that we can have this integration between change management and release management, and therefore it aligns those two systems, right? So rather than dual keying or dual maintaining today, where you'd have to go and maintain something in your non-SAP landscape and then come and maintain it back in SAP, for example, 
that then becomes an alignment um, and once again an automated process. Um, and touching on that last little topic, like we said, uh, where we kind of try and drive this is exactly around pushing that change process into, for example, here, the active control side of things, so the SAP side of things, to manage those transports, manage that change successfully and efficiently through the landscapes. The follow-on client we have now, um, or the third, the third topic you'll have, is bringing essentially both SAP and non-SAP into, into a, a, an account here. Um, as per the one slide deck that, that David worked us, walked us through, this client is Ericsson. Um, and what they were doing, they were kind of one of the first ones that wanted to bring in this holistic view of SAP and non-SAP orchestration. Um, so not just looking at things like your change process, which you're trying to be that we just touched on before, but more on physical actions or physical uh, deployments, physical dependencies between these two systems or these two landscapes. Um, and essentially what they did here between this orchestration is they automated the imports between SAP and non-SAP. They made sure that there was dependencies uh, controlled between these two landscapes. So they could actually say, perfect, we know we've got a web deployment that has to go into production first, prior to the actual SAP change being there or being present within the production system. Um, and therefore that allowed them to have total landscape orchestration. Um, it also cut down on any manual activities. Of course, there were still some around, for example, manual cutover steps, but essentially any type of manual deployment, uh, manual rekeying, all of that was kind of automated um, down to the fact that they brought these two landscapes together. Um, and as you can see, there's a stack that we have there um, because of this orchestration and using this automatic deployment, uh, they did do that across 15 different enterprise applications, including SAP, which is one of them, which is fantastic. So that's from a client perspective or a client example perspective. Um, what I'll be taking you through next now is just a best of breed. Um, and once again, this is just something that we do touch on with, mul with multiple of our clients. It's not to say that there's not other tools out there, there definitely are. Um, but this is something we do see very regularly at most of our clients that we do implement with. Um, in terms of from a, a change management perspective or from a, a ECM, a service desk perspective, we have ServiceNow uh, and they typically are the most of our clients, I'd say, use a ServiceNow, a ServiceNow to manage their change process. Um, that will then feed into your, as David said previously, a JIRA. In this case, that is where your backlog management gets done, your developer management gets done, um, and essentially your developers kind of track those changes in this case from an actual ITSM perspective. Um, that then feeds into a non-SAP pipeline. So if you are plugging it into things like um, web-based applications, if you are plugging it into a change management tool that is, for example, non-SAP as well, that can trigger pipelines into your release management process. Um, and of course, as you would imagine, um, we've got active control here, which then governs that SAP uh, change and release management process from an SAP perspective to manage those transports. Um, so with these four items in place, you'd basically have the best of breed, which would do the full platform, the full end-to-end -end view of your change management process right down into your uh, risk management process, which completes the full end-to-end -end life cycle. So the next slides I'll be taking us through is essentially the best practices, right? So there are four topics I do want to touch on. Uh, possibly the ones we would say are the four most important. It's not to say they're the only best practices, of course there are many, um, but these are probably the four we've identified or we, we, we kind of always usually like to bring up with clients as they are the most common in this case. So the very first one you're gonna see now from a best practice perspective is always trying to avoid those manual steps, right? So the one kind of punchline I put here, which I like to say to clients is that stop accepting manual processes as the norm. It, it, it isn't. It isn't the norm and it isn't necessary. Right? We shouldn't be making uh, manual steps um, a norm in this case. It should be something that is, unless there is a reason for it, where we might have to, a very, very good example is having to activate something uh, once deployment is done, no problem. Uh, but if it is, for example, anything that can be automated, imports, uh, dual, dual keying, retrofitting, etc., all that should be kind of an automated process. We try and get to this wonderful picture that we have there, the slide of saying, look, we can do twice as much, twice as fast if we literally have automation in place and we don't have the manual step there. Um, if we have manual step, once again, that just becomes a break in the process, which makes things a lot more difficult in today's world. The second best practice that you'll see here um, 
it's basically just trying to evolve involve security early so one mistake that a lot of clients do um, and a lot of projects essentially do is they do involve the security side of things or the security side of sap projects um, way too late in the engagement so what happens is during the project life cycle they'll bring them in once there's obviously implementation happening already or even post implementation just to give as an example authorizations to a certain aspect um, now that's too far what happens is we should be involving security way before because they are the ones that can kind of drive process documentation or rather process um, discussions that can drive around things when it comes to user or business uh, impacts rather than just SAP specific around technical. Um, so essentially bringing in the security early on in the project does drive that adoption and drive an impact a bit better um, in the aspect of a project release in this case. The third option you'll see, or rather the third best practice what we'll have here, you will actually see what we call risk profiling for maximum efficiency. Um, and this touches on, which I will which I will bring up, something that's very um, personal to me around what we like to implement at clients. It's one of my favorite things to implement at client, which is something called risk guard, which I will bring up. But essentially what you got here is we are trying to automate that workflow from a lower risk perspective. So if there are objects that are very, very low risk, for example, your standard day-to-day -day change that requires kind of a second eyeball, um, what we're trying to do is to automate that workflow, right? So if there is no check to be done, if we know it can go into production with little impact or, or no impact in this case, um, those should be automated in such a way to deploy them uh, as and when we can. The second part of this is more around now identifying that high risk object. So essentially, it's making sure that once those high risk objects are identified, we actually do manage them um, firstly appropriately, but secondly, in a successful way that they go from a development system through to production um, in the right manner. So as an example here, what I've put here are things like number ranges, you know, your table indexes, table structures, transport tables, et cetera. All those are the very high risk objects that we should essentially um, get notified on and basically say, hey, look, you know, this may impact production once it goes in, therefore take a, a second look at it. And once again, it's, it's actually automating those checks. So rather than things being, as per the first best practice, manual, it's automating in such a way that it actually identifies this risk, helps the teams kind of cut down on impacts in production. Um, and that's where Risk Guard, for example, comes in. It's an analysis part of our tooling that then helps kind of identify this risk. Um, the fourth item you'll basically see, and the last best practice I've put in, once again, we got others, but it was just to keep these short and sweet, is around audit compliance and SOCs. Of course, this becomes more and more and more apparent nowadays. In the past, it always was very important, but now as we do see things like you know, breaches of security, um, audit checks, compliance checks, et cetera, SAP is being more and more governed, more and more compliant, therefore all the more reason to kind of keep this as a best practice. Um, so what we try and do is drive that government process, try and enforce that audit compliance, uh, both in the change process, as well as in the release process as a whole. Um, this does include, of course, all components, right? So both SAP and non-SAP. Um, what we do want to do is ensure that we do have the right reporting in place. We do want to make sure we have the right kind of control in place. And that, may that be with the risks that we just spoke about previously in the slide, uh, which was around risk guard or, or identifying high risk, making sure that transports do go to production with less impact or they are actually governed before they go through. Things like ensuring you don't manage your own change into production, um, et cetera. That's kind of what we're trying to look at, right? So making sure we have a log an event history of everything we've done and staying compliant in doing so. So what I'm going to take you through next, um, which you'll basically see, um, is now the last one, which is don't only look at today and definitely think beyond our app, of course. Um, and David once again touched on this and so did I previously in other slide decks. This is just an example of an end to end of how we like to kind of set up the DevOps world or set up kind of the actual best practice perspective. So you'll actually see tooling here from you know, initial kickoff for things like we discussed around ServiceNow Jira, when it comes to your ITSM or change management process, that then moves into the CD perspective, the CI, as we'd call it, which is managing that actual change in SAP or release. You have things like GitHub, GitLab, that will kind of manage that orchestration or that pipelining between your SAP and non-SAP. And then you have the CD, right, which is obviously the delivery side of things, which is making sure we deploy and run with everything efficiently and effectively. 
Um, and this does talk to things like cloud and on-premise as well. So it can be where you do manage your changes within the cloud. Nowadays, that's more and more apparent. We are moving things from on-premise to cloud, and that's the way we know SAP is going. So essentially, it's trying to manage that effectively and efficiently. Um, and we can do that through, once again, as it says, they don't only look at today, but think beyond ABAP. A lot of the older thinking is around just ABAP-based, which nowadays we need to orchestrate and integrate between our different tool sets. Thank you, David. So essentially, in summary, team, um, we've got kind of these bullet points that we'd like to walk you through or rather kind of tell you about. So that there are different, what we touched on was there are different or there are multiple types of orchestration, specifically when we are talking about, you know, SAP change and release, um, and they are only increasing. That is true. They are only getting bigger. There's only more and more tool sets kind of coming in, more orchestration we have to handle, things like BTP that are now coming into play, um, et cetera. So it's managing both that SAP and non-SAP um, and that orchestration across different landscapes and obviously different uh, aspects. The other thing is when we are when you are architect, uh, when you are architecting your integrations, we definitely have to keep in mind the previous slide deck, right? Which is end-to-end -to -end tool chain, um, as well as that CI C D platforming. So it's making sure that when we are kind of identifying that architecture, identifying how we should be integrating these systems in such a way, it's keeping that end-to-end -end in mind. Of course, keeping it short sweet, getting the short wins in there from one change management process to a release process, for example, is perfect. But it's keeping in mind that full kind of workflow to make it efficient and effective and automated, of course. Um, well, you'll see there's a little, a little bit of identification around benefits when you try and create this business case for any of the toolings. Um, and the ones that we kind of wanted to highlight very, very much was around making sure we don't have things like rework. So making sure there's nothing that's been um, apparent into production uh, due to the fact that we've missed a pansy. So if something breaks, for example, uh, we don't want to have to redo that work, right? Or kind of recreate the wheel. Um, everything is there. It's just making sure we identify that, make sure dependencies are caught early, um, and therefore making sure production is safe to avoid that rework and those outages in this case. We also want to cut down on manual effort, which we've talked about previously, and that's through automation. That's through making sure that we definitely have things tracked efficiently and effectively, and making sure that obviously we've got the tool chains there to help us do that. The other thing uh, we spoke about was around enforcing their quality via code quality and testing automation. So things around like ATC, things around, for example, unit testing, et cetera, all those things to enforce um, and to drive that quality of code, to drive that quality of testing prior to moving to a, um, a pre-production or production, for example. And the last one, which you know, both David and, I, David and I have touched on quite, uh, quite a bit, is around that single source of truth. So that doesn't just, that doesn't just exist today in, once again, one tool that will be across the tool chain, across the workflow, to ensure that there is one source of truth between all these directions, all these integrations um, of that tool chain in this case. Very good. Um, thanks, John. Um, just a quick reminder for anyone to uh, post questions into the, uh, the question panel. Um, John, we have one question in. Where would you suggest to start and, and how would you build from there? There's obviously a lot of different examples that you've given. Um, what are your thoughts on that one? So, so great question. Um, what, what I definitely recommend, the, the one bullet point we had there, which is really good, of course, is that all the, the architecture, which we all kind of do as SAP, as SAP people and non-SAP people, but definitely trying to start off from um, the initial phase. So in this case, I'd say start small, make big, but always think big in this case. So starting small, what I mean is you have got your SAP today in place. It's making sure that the SAP kind of integration uh, between your landscapes, so the orchestration between your, for example, ECC and BW is there prior to then actually connecting that to your further landscapes, right? So the first step would make sure that you've got automation, orchestration happening between your SAP landscapes. Once that's in place, then you start moving towards the other tool chains. Um, and first step, I'd probably say go towards change process, most important, and then branch that out as you go. Um, but yeah, definitely key there would be start small, but definitely think big, of course. Okay, very good. 
Thanks, John. Now, there is obviously a lot more information out there. We've kind of focused in on one particular topic uh, for this month's webinar uh, around the integration and orchestration aspects. There are many other webinars that we've conducted in the past, um, as well as other blogs and ebooks uh, and case studies on our website, um, all of which you can find uh, from the homepage at basistechnologies.com. Um, and here are the uh, contact details for both myself and John, uh, in case you'd like to reach out to us after the webinar with any particular questions or comments. Um, but with that, uh, I think we've covered really what we wanted to, hopefully given you a, um, a kind of an understanding of the breadth and the complexity uh, that's facing most teams nowadays when it comes to orchestrating and managing change within an SAP uh, landscape and beyond, and some of the key integration opportunities that, that exist uh, to help drive more automation um, within, your, uh, within your estates. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to say thanks to John for, uh, for taking part today with us. Thanks for everyone who has joined. And uh, we'll be wrapping up there, giving, giving you maybe 20 minutes or so back. Thanks, John. Thanks, everyone. Bye for now. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, everyone.